Greetings and welcome to St. Theodore of Tarsus, Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church here in Cardiff, sunny South Wales. Um, the purpose of this video and all subsequent videos in the series is to introduce you to who we are as a church, the community that we belong to as Ukrainian Greek Catholics, and where it is our traditions come from. We're going to begin then with a tour of St. Theodore's and tell you a little bit about um, how it is we came to, to uh, live our lives in, the, in this particular building and what it is that we're about, hopefully giving you a sense for what you will encounter when you come to visit us. Moving from the porch of our church into the narthex, we're now standing in a part of the church that is dedicated to those who have not yet entered into the full life of the faith. This is a place where traditionally those who were being instructed in the Christian religion would take their place during the celebration of divine liturgy, before that moment in the liturgy where they would be dismissed. We don't really have catechumens today, but the division in the church exists nonetheless, and certainly within the liturgy itself, we do pronounce the dismissal of the catechumens at the end of their particular litany. I'll be saying more about that when we talk about the specifics of the divine liturgy in a later video. In the meantime, I want to comment on some of the differences that you will encounter when you walk through our doors. These are most particularly uh, visible in the holy icons. So you'll see immediately behind me the icon of the Theotokos and the icon of Christ the Pantocrator. And this is the dividing line, really, between what I discussed as the narthex and what we will shortly step into then, the nave. One of the reasons it's much more space, spacious in, in this building is that we were graciously uh, granted use of it by the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Cardiff, although we are not Roman Catholics, in the hope that this uh, church, which is still used by a small Roman Catholic uh, parish, that is that of St. Cuthbert's, would be uh, put to uh, use attracting people who might find their faith best lived out in an Eastern context. In any case, Moving from narthex to nave, we find that there are more icons in the church than the two I just introduced you to. So, for example, here in this part of the church that symbolizes our living out of the Christian faith, you find yourself surrounded by the saints. And so on both the north and the south walls, you've got a number of saints depicted. Over on my right, you will see St. Olya, followed by St. Augustine and St. Jerome, just tucked around the corner. St. Athanasius, St. John Chrysostom, and St. Anastasios the Persian, while over here we've got St. Isaac the Syrian, St. Basil the Great, St. Gregory Nazianzen, and um, St. Ephraim the Syrian, St. Maximus Confessor, and St. Irenaeus of Lyon. The saints depicted could be any, and that would depend on those saints that are of greatest interest uh, to any given community. These saints happen to be very special to me, and because uh, as a priest who has contributed uh, to the foundation of this uh, mission church, I had uh, a great deal of say in, in, in the icons that got selected. As we move forward, we find the tetrapod. Now the tetrapod is used for a number of purposes uh, across the liturgical year, but when it's not in specific use for any given liturgy, it bears our festal icon, that is the icon of the feast day, or more particularly, the icon of our patron. And in this case, it is, of course, St. Theodore of Tarsus. To um, the right of the uh, tetrapod, as we face it, is another icon of Christ the Pantocrator, and then on the left of Holy Mary, the Theotokos, the God-bearer. And these icons are on stands in order that the faithful might come in and venerate them. Now, to a stranger, there might be some question as to what it means to venerate. When somebody visits us, they might be confused by all the bowing, the touching of the floor and the crossing of oneself that they see, and they may not uh, feel comfortable with it, particularly because they don't know what it means or where it comes from or even perhaps how to do it. There's really no mystery to it. The holy icons allow us to express our love and our respect for those who are depicted in them. So, when we see an icon of Christ, we know that it is not Christ himself, but it is Christ himself depicted. We are never to worship an icon, 
we always venerate icons. And that is a very important distinction that goes back uh, deep in the history of the Church. To venerate is to, as I've already said, express our love and respect for the one depicted. And so when the faithful approach the icon of Christ and kiss it, and bow before it, they are not bowing before a piece of wood covered in paint. They are rather bowing before the, the presence of Christ and by kissing the icon are really asking that that kiss be delivered to Christ himself. Now, probably one of the things you noticed most particularly is the backdrop to this video. Of course, what you see looming behind you is a wall of icons. We call that the iconostas. And on it, especially on this side, is another depiction of Christ. This is Christ the Panikrafor, and he always holds that position on the icon, uh, on the iconostas. To the left, you see, again, uh, an image of Holy Mary, the Theotokos, the God-bearer. The middle section represents the holy doors. Those are, in fact, the holy doors. And on them, you will see very often either the four evangelists, the writers of the Gospels, or the Annunciation, or in our case, a combination of both. This is because through them, we enter into the mystery of heaven. Through the mystery of salvation, initiated by God's declaration to Mary through the words of the angel Gabriel, the whole uh, process of the Incarnation is, is set forth. The whole moment of our salvation begins and then, be, and then continues to unfold. First in um, the pregnancy of the Theotokos, then in the delivery of Christ and the Nativity, and everything that happens subsequent to that. Alternately, of course, we only learn about this through the evangelists, through the writing of the Gospels, and this is why they too are depicted there on the royal doors or on the holy doors. Beyond them, then, you get smaller doors, and these are called the deacons' doors. It is through these that the deacons, the servers, pass over the course of any given liturgy. And in the case of our uh, right, uh, the deacon's door on the right, you see uh, St. Stephen depicted, of course, one of the first deacons, and a proto-martyr, one of the first martyrs of the church. And here we see an image of uh, St. Michael, one of the holy angels. Beyond that division, we then enter into the altar, or the Holy of Holies. This is a division very much reminiscent of the division of the ancient temple in Jerusalem, where the pre only the priest could pass and enter into the Holy of Holies and offer incense and sacrifice. We, of course, do not continue to let blood in sacrifice. We do not somehow uh, re-offer what Christ has offered once and for all. What we do is to re-present what Christ at once presented on the altar of the cross on Calvary. How do we do this? Of course, it is in the Divine Liturgy, in the celebration of the Holy Eucharist. And it is in the, it is in the prayers of the Divine Liturgy, it is in all the actions of the Divine Liturgy, that we make this known in much the same way that our faith in Christ, in the Theotokos, the Mother of God, in the saints is made known through icons. The liturgy, which we will come to know more about in a future video, is the ultimate icon of the Church, insofar as through it we encounter Christ in the truest and fullest sense possible in this life.